Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome an entrepreneur who is about to open their own shop, but has not yet, which got me thinking about startup costs. What are they? Why are they important? And why should an entrepreneur care? First, there are a lot of startup costs that go into starting a business, and this is simply to highlight a few that we may have forgotten, such as incorporation fees. Whether you are going to start an LLC, S-Corp, C-Corp, or other, there are going to be some fees, and those fees can range between $50 to $750 depending on the state. Even if you are not going to become an incorporation, chances are the entrepreneur will need to apply for federal or state licensings or permit to ensure legality. For example, businesses within the agriculture or aviation sector require federal licensings. Service-based sectors may need to have trade-specific licensings, and retail companies will likely need sales tax licensings or permits. Websites are another startup cost we may have forgotten about. Web pages will come from either monthly or yearly subscription costs that must be taken into consideration. Thankfully, some services make it real easy to build out a business web page. But if the business wants a premium web page, hiring a professional will add to the startup cost. Marketing. My goodness. Marketing is so important, but it should not take up the entire budget. Try to keep ad materials less than 10% of the overall budget and get creative with videos. However, production like that may require a consultant. And last but certainly not least, insurance. Businesses need protecting just like your home, your car, your personal health. We all need insurance. There are many different kinds of business insurance, including protection of the consumer filing lawsuits against you and disaster insurance for potential fires that can shut down your restaurant for weeks. So make sure to identify the right plan for your business. So what are you waiting for? Get out there, uncover some startup fees, and get innovating. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. a sense of community. Today, I'm here with possibly a distant cousin. We are not sure yet. Joel Flores, the owner of Wallflower Coffee Company. Joel, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you today? Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Uh, I love coffee. Just throwing that out there. Big, big coffee drinker. So first, let's uh, introduce the listeners at home to Joel. Who is Joel? So, uh, my name is Joel, as Gabe mentioned. I've been living in Portland for the last seven years or so. Originally a Bay Area native. Go 49ers. <laughs> oh, oh, we got to cut this out. We're oh, a Raiders no. Nation over here, oh, buddy. No. This is oh, Raider no. Nation. We, we're, we're I know they moved. This. I, know, I know they recently <laughs> moved, but in my heart, they're always going to be Bay Area. You know? We're going to have to cut this interview short. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm from the Bay Area, and one of those things is that I came to Portland kind of as a bit of a transplant, so I'm one of those guys that's just like, oh, do I even belong here? Because I feel like there's like such like a nativist kind of like <laughs> approach when it comes to Portland in particular. Like, and it's a city. We're and different, it, yeah. It, it, it's, and it's a city. It's a city and that's in transition to as well. So coming into the whole scene, uh, I, I, I kind of look at it from a position of like, oh, I, I'm here, I'm living here, I've been here, but I'm still kind of figuring out my ways around this town. Right, right. So, so what, what brought you to Oregon? Uh, opportunity, really. I, I had a bit of a, 
a counseling background. I was also fairly religious, so I thought that I was going to go into being a clergy. I was going to go to seminary. Never happened, obviously. <laughs> and uh, I just decided that, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. I did get into the nonprofit sector, and it definitely had more of an emphasis of, like, working with people, counseling with people, uh, being a neighbor. And that, that's always been my philosophy, my, 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 my MO. Like, how can I be a neighbor to folks within the area, wherever I stay? And so I worked for a local nonprofit. I will probably leave their name out of the air just because. Yeah, I, that's fine. But I did that for a number of years in Portland, and I've always been just kind of the kind of guy that just always wants to be part of the community in some form or fashion. Nice. Now, coffee. Why, why coffee? Coffee? Uh, so I have a bit of a connection with coffee just for, for a myriad of reasons. Um, my dad was a coffee farmer in Honduras. Nice. Way back in the day. Nice. Uh, that was before they had to leave the country because of war and conflict and whatnot in yeah. the region, mm. which is rough. That is rough. But I've always grown up with coffee. Coffee has always been a part of my story, even in the Bay Area. Um, as a kid, my dad would give me, I was that kid that my dad would get coffee to. Probably was not the best idea. Super hyper. <laughs> Still, you know, I, I've always known coffee to be a part of my, my fabric my, within my story. The fabric within my story. How would I? That's kind of a weird way of phrasing it. But you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's the fabric of my story, yeah. essentially. Uh, I, I, my real coffee experience was actually just outside of Sacramento, California. Okay. Uh, there was this like little nonprofit coffee shop. So I think that's where the nonprofit kind of like plays into it because it was very much a community coffee shop. Yeah. And it was kind of the hub where neighbors would meet, hang out. People got to know each other. So I've always associated coffee with being around at the table, whether it was with my dad or whether it was with the neighbor just across the street. Uh, coffee has always been a part of this idea of like, being intentionally present with folks. And so yeah. that's, that's part of the reason why I'm, into co- why I'm getting into coffee now. And so wallflower, is there any type of particular meaning behind it? So um, I'm glad that you asked. Um, that name is actually kind of inspired by our love for 60s and 70s music. Nice. Uh, we All weren't right. originally Wallflower Coffee Company. Um, there was a song that we were going to go with um, called Sundown. So we were going to be Sundown Coffee Company. What we didn't really, really realize was that Sundown has a bit of a, a bit of an, a racist connotation oh, in the state of Oregon. And so that was a whole kind of like, oh, shoot, like we need to change. We need to kind of like dial back a little bit on the name. Um, what, what was originally intended to be good ended up just being kind of problematic. And we didn't realize that until one of our neighbors came up and they were like, hey, by the way, Sundown City, Sundown Towns. Not saying that that's your coffee shop, right. but some some people might, you know, look into that and might read into that and like realize like that's probably not the best name, especially in the state like Oregon. And so we had to kind of go through a bit of an evolution of like, okay, well, what do we want to do, you know, for our shop, you know, as far as like a name goes. So Wallflower, um, there's a lot of associations with music in particular, Bob Dylan has a song called Wallflower. It's one of his, like one of his like bootleg songs. Um, And uh, we, we liked the, the cadence of the song. It kind of felt kind of in keeping with like kind of like who we are stylistically, mm-hmm. um, kind of acoustic folk, kind of like a little bit of a country, kind of like hazy kind of like vibe. Um, we're not a themed country, hazy coffee shop by no means. But, <laughs> but we want to kind of give a little bit of that, you know, that aura of like, man, this is something that you're, you're kind of intimately familiar with. It sounds familiar. It looks familiar, but you've never been here before. <laughs> and so what... Your dad previously worked in the coffee field. Yes. What all goes in the coffee? Because I think, I know I drink it every day. Sure. <laughs> I don't know if I really know what goes into the coffee. Like what goes into producing it? How does it get into my cup? So, you know, I, 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 I coffee is a very difficult plant to grow and cultivate. Last I checked. Uh, <laughs> and I will be honest with you. I am not the expert on it. I wish my dad was here because he can like tell you verbatim, just like this is the process, but it takes years. It takes years to actually have like an actual good harvest and planting the trees. You know, well, the coffee trees are bushes. There's always a debate about that, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Is it a bush? Is it a tree? Yes. Yes. Maybe it it, it gives coffee beans. Like it's producing coffee beans. Uh, And my dad was a coffee farmer um, in his youth, Honduras, out on the hills, and part of that process this is the result of just like making sure that the soil is good you have the right height temperature is very important 
Um, and there's a lot of other things that you got to consider. So I, I think the real process is just determining like location, location, location. Like, okay, where we're we going to plant, you know, these, um, these seeds, where we're we going to plant these uh, coffee plants, you know, so that we can have a good product and whatnot. And um, they happen to be in a very high enough region within Honduras, right climate. I mean, it's a tropical climate. So naturally there's going to be some good coffee out there. So yeah, that, in fact, that region of the country of the entire world, it has the amazing coffee, Colombia, yeah. Chile, and Honduras. I mean, that is most of your coffee tends to come from that region. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with wallflower, you know, one of the things I think that's interesting that folks at uh, home should know is you guys are just, you, you haven't even opened up the store yet. Right. Um, I should mention, by the way, it's both me and my business partner, Grace Galatly. She's not here today. She's taking the day off. She's nice. just relaxing. She's like, it's Labor Day. Gotta I'm gonna, take the I'm day. gonna relax. <laughs> like, I don't want to do anything. And totally understandable. I like so, it. I, I'm here. <laughs> so, did you guys decide LLC, S Corp, C Corp? How? What did you guys? Yeah, do? we decided LLC just because we are a very small operation, mm-hmm. and we're very much in the weeds of the business itself. It's just her and I. Yeah, she brings on more of the creative side of things. I bring on more of like kind of the administration, logistics side of things. And part of the reason why we wanted to be an LLC is because we want to be member managed. It's just her and I. It doesn't really make sense to be anything other than that right. at this time. Right. We're not a chain. We're not some big corporation. We're just a small little business right. on Southeast Division and 32nd. Come find us when like we it. open. Um, and... We're making it happen, but really, it's just been her and I, and a handful of other people that have come along with us, who are not necessarily part of our LLC. But you know, we we want to be open enough in the event that there's other people that want to come along with our journey mm-hmm. on, on that extra step of like actual ownership or partnership. Rather, we want to keep that available for folks. So let's let's uh let's talk about the the process of kind of going through where you're at now, because again, as we mentioned, you guys your location is not open yet. What goes into what you're doing? Trying to create a brand, create a company, and grand open it, getting the word out. Sure. What all does it go into that? Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and mind you, like, I don't have a business background. This is my first business. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so everything that we're doing is just kind of like we're we're, we're learning as as we go. Yeah. Uh, I found out that what goes into starting a coffee shop in particular, y- y- you need a product first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, we had to decide whether or not we want to just be solely just a cafe, so we're just using other people's beans, which which is not an issue. Or did we want to, like, create our own product, roast our own product? We're currently working through a private label company, so it's a third party mm-hmm. that's uh, roasting our coffee. And we've been working with them, but it's under our branding. It's under kind of, like, our, you know, specifics of what we want within our coffee. And so... Developing the product has been really the focus of the last year. Mm. And we definitely want to cater to the fact that coffee is not something that you just have around the clock. Coffee comes around seasonally, depending on what part of the world you're in. So this previous season, this last, this summer season, we have a Colombia, we have an Ethiopia. We were also looking into a Peru just in keeping with the seasons. And so right. we want to go uh, with what makes sense as far as like, you know, distribution goes and like kind of like harvest goes and we want to provide the freshest product that we can on the market. Yeah. And now, now what you, you mentioned previously, this is your first business. Yes. What have you learned? What, what is a, <laughs> what is the learning curve for you? Cause you mentioned earlier, hey, yeah. you're not a business guy, but no. what, what have you learned so far? Um, I've learned that this is just a lot, but anybody can do it at the end of the day. Anybody can do it, whether you're young, old, you're, it's never too late. It's never too early. There's yep. never really ever a good time to get into business. Yes, there never is. <laughs> uh, but take a risk. I mean, it's a lot of fun. I, I've learned that. I, I, I know that you have an education, you know, within within business and whatnot, but I, I would actually argue that there's a lot of things online yeah. that are pretty helpful. And also just getting connected. I, I found what's been really helpful for me is get, getting connected with other business owners, other entrepreneurs, other people that are within this field and getting their advice. So mm-hmm. a lot of what I've learned is the result of people that I'm in connection with that are already in it to win it. And they've been doing this for years and different capacities. I'm, I'm talking about like freelancers, photographers, uh, other boutique shop, coffee shop owners, all kinds of people that are like kind of like in a similar industry or have some kind of model that's kind of relatable in that sense. 
I've learned that really relying on the people that know what they're doing has been the most helpful thing and humbling experience. Like you, I, I, I've learned that in business, you got to be humble. Yeah. If you come on in, <laughs> thinking that's very that you, true. You thinking that you know what you're going to do? They'll get your ego put in check pretty quick. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I, and I, I think I'm a pretty humble guy myself. But there's been some moments where I've really had to like let my guard down a little bit and just mm. like, ugh. Here we go. This is this is it. This is what it is. Yeah. And, you know, you made a very good point in regards to education. You know, for the listeners at home, there is so many free education opportunities available for you. Books. You can go to the library and get a book. Uh, most of what you do in business has probably already been researched and written about. Yeah. You know, every, every aspect of business. Networking is so important. That's why, you know, I I keep telling folks, you mentioned, you know, I I got a degree at Syracuse. However, what I learned in Syracuse is basically what I'm doing here now. So take this opportunity as a listener. This is free education for you. You know, I'm I'm interviewing these entrepreneurs for you to really indulge yourself and say, hey, these are what, this is what really goes on in this, this industry, right? I think there's this misconception where it's a quick rich gets kind of scheme and it's not it's a lot of a lot of behind the scenes work and some of these founders and entrepreneurs they don't become successful the first year you know how has this first year for wallflower been for you <laughs> um, we're in the red <laughs> especially if you're opening up a coffee shop let's just be honest coffee is really oversaturated especially in portland anywhere on the west coast really any major city has a plethora of coffee shops and coffee roasteries that you can go to, and they're all great. I highly recommend them all. That said, there's not a whole lot of money in this industry to begin with, <laughs> especially if you're trying to start out as a new coffee shop. Yeah. And we feel fortunate because we it was all timing on our end. So we came across the space uh, back in February, actually, uh, when we found out that there was this turnkey situation and ended up not being a full trunky situation. That's a whole other story for another day. <laughs> but we were going into it. And I was pretty burnt out at, at that time in my life um, from my previous job. I was pretty tired. And I, and I knew that I needed to change. I, I'm, I'm about to enter into my 30s. And I am just realized, like, man, this was a great phase in life working, you know, within this capacity. But I needed to do something different. And so when this opportunity presented itself, I'm like, oh, of course. Like, this is something that's always been a dream of mine. That said, I, I didn't anticipate a lot of the hurdles that would come into really figuring out stuff. Both I and my business partner, we've been really reliant on people that we've known to kind of come along to our aid. Um, in particular, let's just kind of just break it down. Branding mm. um, was outside of the product, you know, like developing the product. Branding was kind of a bit of a hurdle for our for us too as well because we had to kind of like come up with a bit of an identity. And if you know anything about Portland coffee shops, they all kind of look alike. It's yeah. Kind of <laughs> I, sorry, guys. You guys I are love, great, though. I, I love I, all of you. All, all, everybody, all the OGs, they're great, you know, when it comes to coffee and whatnot. But we want to bring something a little bit different. And we knew from the get-go that we had to do something a little different. Uh, and I know that I feel like every coffee shop says that, you know, like, oh, we're doing something a little bit different here and there. And that's great. But we knew that we had to try really extra hard to just be that little bit of Add that little je ne sais quoi, you know, something, something that will make sense for the neighborhood, would make sense for the community at large. It would make sense for, you know, kind of our city. And and we're still trying to figure that out, actually. Yeah. We got a good uh, designer on, 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 our, um, on our team. Uh, her name is Liz Chai. Fantastic lady. Uh, she's been working with us last several months, just, just coming up with a bit of a, a look and appeal to the community. Nice. And it's been really cool working with her for the most part. And then along with that, we've had a lot of people come on in, giving us inspiration too for our, you know our branding and our and our marketing too. And so that's the other thing too. It's like, how do we market our image too? That's also been kind of a bit of a weird thing because it's like we're operating for we were operating for the longest time without a space. So mm. here we are coming up with the product, announcing that we're going to become a cafe. We knew where we were located, but we weren't really in the space to begin with, you know, up until recently. So we're now finally in the space. We're getting it all suited up and whatnot. But marketing a coffee shop that has yet to really kind of exist is really tough. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, definitely. So so explain to the listeners at home what exactly will be sold at your guys' cafe. Is it just coffee where you guys have pastries? Yeah, so we're going to have coffee, um, various coffee varieties, various coffee varieties, yeah. 
uh, and pastries. We're trying to determine right now whether or not we're going to have like a local baker do that for us or if we're going to, we did have a baker on our team. Um, and unfortunately that didn't really work out, flush out just because they found a great opportunity to work with another bakery gotcha. as, as a head baker. So yeah. we're, we're, we're looking for a baker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, plug, plug right now for those listening at home. If you know local bakers that are yeah. interested in partnering with a local coffee company, please know. In fact, one of our former guests, uh, Giovanni Giovanni, if you're listening, what's going on, shout out to you. And then the coffee feed team would be another great um, team to connect with because again, a part of this podcast is really connecting folks, right? How can we how can we build this um, country back? You know, one small business at a time kind of philosophy, and so marketing is is very difficult. How how have you done it with a company that's it's not even open yet? I think we've been very honest about our process. Okay, and so obviously there's some easy avenues, so social media in particular, Instagram. You can follow us on Wallflower Coffee Company, and we have been really sharing our story this whole time. Yeah. So we don't have the space, we don't have the wares per se to really kind of showcase like this amazing product and this amazing space. But what we do have is kind of like our kind of vision for the space, our values, and, you know, how we want to be allies to the community. And I know that a lot of coffee shops talk about community, and I've talked to a few people like, avoid that topic, everybody uses it. And they're probably right because I feel like in a weird way we do market that a little bit and you have to in this day and age. Um, But I think for us, we really want to like actually let let that be part of our formula as Mm -hmm. people. Uh, Grace, my business partner, she, I I mentioned earlier that she's more of the creative side of things and whatnot. She's been a barista for a number of years within Portland. And so she has a lot of people that she's connected with within the community. And in particular, she actually worked out of that space when it was another previous coffee shop. So that's something I didn't mention, actually. We came across the space because she had a connection to the space. Mm. And when that coffee shop had folded, you know, it was a vacant space. It, it was a, kind of a bit of a missing link. And so naturally, there was already a story being brewed. No pun intended. No coffee pun intended. <laughs> well played, though. Well played. <laughs> people were missing that coffee shop. And, and, but much more than that, people were missing the people that were involved in that coffee shop, too, as well. Mm. Yeah, it was, it was part of everybody's rhythm. And right. so I think marketing our story has been the most beneficial and, 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 and dare I say, probably the, the emphasis of just who we are and whatnot, how we're trying to bring back a space that is not just another coffee shop, but rather, you know, we're there for our neighbors. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that has been based out of our own story and our connection with our friends and our neighbors in nice. the neighborhood. So how have how did you guys start the business with funding? Did you guys go the venture capital route, grassroots effort? Um, a little bit of both. So initially, we wanted to you know do the whole Kickstarter thing because uh, we definitely had no money. Like I was a nonprofit, <laughs> she was a, a barista, <laughs> and so you know we're, we're 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 two young kids and we're just trying yeah. to figure things out. Yeah. Next thing you know, we're like, oh shoot, here's this coffee shop. Where has the money to come from? Yeah. Kickstarter. Kickstarter ended up being a real major fail. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> And and, 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 and by fail, it it was a learning curve for us. You know, we learned a lot in that process. And what we found to be most effective for us is venture capital, but not with our own money. So we had to, like, seek out investors and whatnot. And that was also a lot of fun, too, as well, because we had a number of people that were interested in the shop. But something that, you know, we have to take into account is that there's still a lot of risk involved, especially opening up a coffee shop in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. People want to know that you're going to succeed. And so what has helped us is really re- relating with folks, our values as a shop and, you know, and also just having a bit of a kind of a, a framework of like, okay, Hey, this is what we anticipate. This is what, you know, our goals are, are at. Um, this is what we expect to be making within the next five years. This is how we're going to break even so on and so forth. And so when we begin to have a little bit more of an understanding as far as like the the specs of the business itself, um, that put people at ease. And that's how we were able to kind of like att- attain the investors that we have now. Um, just because of agreements and whatnot, I, I can't go online. as I can't, I can't announce who they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> but right. Uh, I, I, we, we, just to kind of give a little bit of a sneak peek into that, a lot of it has been just kind of figuring out kind of like our numbers, like, at the end yeah. of the day, we have to figure out our numbers for investors. Yep. And so that's been really helpful. 
What, so you mentioned, you know, this is your first business you started, right? And you mentioned some of the difficulties. What is something that you learned during this venture capital process that you didn't know about? <laughs> so uh, consumers love a good, good kind of like uh, underdog story. Yeah. Investors, uh, you got to show them the money. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> don't just care. Gotta, you you got to show them the money. <laughs> Man, that is so true. They do not care about those underdogs. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're there. I mean, and it's, I think it's kind of important for the folks at home to know investors are really there to recoup their funds back. Yeah. It's a, and it's an investment, right? They, they anticipate to recoup some type of financial gains from this investment. They're not just kind of throwing out money. Now, when you had to do your pitch... What, what kind of information are investors? So for the folks at home that maybe are starting a company and they've gone the Kickstarter route and it didn't work for them, what are some things that they should know have readily available? You mentioned you're going through your numbers now. Mm-hmm. How important is that, you know, for, for the, uh, to getting the funds from, from some of these folks? Very important. I, I can't emphasize that enough. I would say that, as you mentioned earlier, like people want a return on their investment and then some. And so we want to make sure that anything that we're doing is calculated. And, and, and people always worry when I say calculated, it's like, wait, you mean you have to have like an exact, like, like, no, like have an estimate like, as far as like when you can like pay back that investment, you know, make it worth their while in the process, mm-hmm. things are going to shift. And I think, you know, I think most investors are willing to take a risk. I mean, just the fact that there are people that are willing to throw money down already tells you everything that you need to know about that investor. Yeah. They're, they're probably probably have already been in the business, have already have had some kind of familiarity with the market. And so, you know, if they see value in this and, and, and as long as you have a good business plan, yeah. <laughs> slash hire a person to do your business plan, if you can do it and, you know, go from there. Uh, I would say that as long as you sound like you know what you're talking about because you did your research <laughs> and even if you're not business savvy like me, cause I'm, I'm definitely not the most savviest guy in business, but Take the time. Take the time to really read into it, study up on it, hire someone to help you with your business proposal. We didn't do that. We actually went online and studied up <laughs> what goes into a good business proposal. I wish I did that from the get-go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I wish we did that. But needless to say, uh, I, I, I would definitely advise that. And so that way when, you know, you come across an investor, because there's been some opportunities where it was really off the cuff. I'm at a bar hanging out. Next thing you know, oh, you're opening up a coffee shop? And those instant connections can either mean, A, it's a great networking opportunity with somebody that's interested yeah. in partnering with you, or B, it might be your next investor. That kind of That's kind of what happened with us, uh, actually. So you know, that's, that's an important piece. And this is something I've talked about so often on the show is the networking. How important is networking? Uh, extremely. I, 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 I know that I mentioned that it was just my business partner and I but we wouldn't be doing this thing if it wasn't for the help of people that just come that literally just out of, out of the blue. We're like, Hey, I got this expertise. I got this kind of like business. Let's kind of shake hands on this. I scratch yeah. your back. You scratch my back type yeah. of thing. And, it, it, and that's how we're staying afloat right now. We're in the red, but we're staying afloat. I know it's kind of a bit of a paradox, but, <laughs> but we're doing all right. <laughs> Has there been a moment during this process of self doubt? Absolutely. Uh, I would say back in March, March was a really tough season because I had actually put in my resignation at my previous work. Mm. And so that's when I kind of knew like, oh man, this is it. We're this is it. it. We're going, yeah. we're going full, <laughs> you know, into the situation. And early on in the game, there was still a lot of unknowns. We're still in negotiations, negotiations with the space. And I knew that we didn't have the capital right off the bat. So I was really concerned about that. I was also really concerned about the fact that, you know, that communication was taking a little bit forever too uh, with a number of like different like third parties that were involved in this space. So there was a lot of doubt. There was a lot of concerns. And, and, and I realized that I had to kind of shift my mindset. I, I began to realize that, wait, we're in the early stages. Like if I'm doubting right now, <laughs> that's... Uh, it's okay to have a little bit of healthy doubt, but you have to do the work of exploring, okay, well, where is this coming from? And what can I do to kind of like remedy the situation? Why am I feeling these doubts? And so I spent a good month and a half just kind of just writing down like, oh, man, like well, what are my major concerns and how can I really help myself to kind of like launch myself into something that is uncomfortable? 
Yeah. And that's, that's a great learning opportunity for those folks at home too. It's like, we all have moments of self doubt. Overcoming that self doubt some sometimes be difficult. Yeah. Right. And having a plan in place, like you sound like you had to overcome those self doubt moments is, is so important because sometimes it's, it's kind of you by yourself digging yourself out of that thing, yeah. which is unfortunate, but uh, <laughs> it, it really is. Now looking back on everything, you know, from, from moving, you know, from the, from your dad's fields, what would you, what advice would you give yourself a younger Joel? A younger Joel. I would say don't sweat about it. You know, honestly, and that sounds really just like, you know, cheesy. Don't sweat about it. But life will always like present things that you're completely like that, that are completely out of your control at the end of the day. Yeah. The worst thing that you can do is stay frozen in fear and anxiety and not do anything about it. The best thing you can do is feel all the anxiety, all the fear, and still kind of chip away at it to do something about it. And, and literally rely on folks that are there to support you. And that's, that's been my saving grace, if you will, uh, of just like leaning on people. There's some days where I'm just like, shit, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. And I still got to push forward. I still got to move forward. And that, that's, I, I think you can't really learn that. And, and I feel like I've been told that growing up, even my parents, my uncles, they're all business people. <laughs> It was inevitable, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but they always, they would always tell me like, yeah, you just got to just keep on moving. Things are going to happen. Yeah. Um, my family actually lost their business back in 2008. Um, we were a family of contractors. We worked on like local construction mm. and around Northern California. And 2008 was a bad year for a lot of folks uh, are, uh, and for my folks included. And, you know, I, I learned a lot from them. I, I learned a lot from just like learning how to pivot. Yeah. <laughs> Pivoting is my favorite word now. Like when <laughs> things happen, you just got to pivot. And, and, and that's where you can't sweat about it because it's out of your control, but it doesn't mean that has to be an end. That's true. Now for the folks at home that are interested about wallflower coffee, want to help support it, want to kind of keep up to date. Cause you mentioned the location's going to be opening soon. How can they find you on uh, social media? How can they find you on the internet? Yeah. Uh, so Instagram is a great way to keep up with our story. Wallflower Coffee Co. Uh, there's apparently there's another wallflower out in Malaysia. So <laughs> we share a name. We're not affiliated with them. You can also find us on Facebook. And it's probably the best way to keep up with our story. Honestly, it's the social media aspect. Perfect. Um, for inquiries, if you're curious about our space or wanting to work with us or have like a pop-up situation. We have a few people that are interested in pop-up, which reminds me, I need to follow up with some emails. So I apologize to Andy <laughs> at Sucker Punch. I will get back to you ASAP. I am. Um, those are the things that, you know, we're definitely open to email us or DM us. Our, our email is wallflowercoffeeco at gmail.com. Perfect. Yeah. So you guys hear it first. Wallflower coffee. When's, where's the physical location again? 32nd in division. Which 3158 Southeast Division. So that is our address. We are right across the street from Oma's, which is another amazing restaurant. That is hit true. The, hit the place up. They hooked us up the other night. It was fantastic. Perfect. Joel Flores, the co founder of Wallflower Coffee Company. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.